Hey everyone, um, can you guys hear us in the audience? Yes, they can. Perfect. Welcome, everyone. We have a great webinar today, and I'm excited to have everyone here. We'll we'll start in a couple minutes just to make sure everyone has some time to, to get in. Then we'll then we'll get started. And in the meantime, um, we're going to do like a Q&A at the end. So uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat or in the questions tab on your bottom right. We had a few questions come in before the event, but uh, in the registration form, but uh, feel free to be asking questions the whole time. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So thanks thanks for attending today's webinar, everyone, hosted by Thumbtack and Workies. So for today, we'll discuss how to grow your business from actual service providers who have scaled their business, uh, including five takeaways you can use to, to grow your business. So I'm John, I'm from Thumbtack, and I'll be helping moderate our conversation today with Wes from Workies. We have two amazing speakers today. We'll be leading the conversation uh, with David from Thumbtack and Dan from Workies. So for today's agenda, we'll start with an introduction of David and Dan and understand their backgrounds. Uh, from here, we'll look at the challenges of the service professional industry, uh, provide five impactful solutions that you can utilize to grow your business, and at the end, we'll, we'll have some time for some Q&A with, with Dan and David. If you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to chat them in and, and we'll, we'll address them uh, during the presentation or during the Q&A. Perfect. So our first speaker is Dan, who's currently the co-founder and chief product officer of Workies. Dan also ran a successful locksmith business prior to, to founding Workies. Dan, can you provide you know, our audience more insights about your background and how you got started in the industry? Yes, definitely. So uh, me and uh, the other co-founder actually had a locksmith business uh, for several years here in uh, San Diego. Uh, that business uh, grew very rapidly. Um, by uh, 2010, we were about uh, 30 men strong. Uh, managed to triple ourselves almost every year, uh, servicing not just uh, San Diego, uh, Orange County, uh, Riverside. Um, with that uh, accelerated growth, we, we found that we're not in control of everything. We're not in control of, you know, what we're spending on advertising. We're not in control of, you know, optimizing the way we work and sell. And uh, that's where, uh, you know, uh, our third co-founder joined in. Uh, he's, uh, he wasn't a locksmith, he was a developer, and he helped us develop the original version of Workies, which was just used by us. Um, so that business ended up uh, selling uh, to out-of-town investors, and uh, we were just left with the software uh, that a lot of our friends... Uh, that a lot of our friends actually saw, saw value with. And, uh, you know, that's what brought us here today. Amazing. Thank, thanks so much, Dan. Mm -hmm. uh, now I'm going to turn it over to David, who's the current senior director at Thumbtack. Uh, David has run a successful con construction business prior to his, la his last business being, being acquired by Thumbtack. Thanks, John. Uh, it's great to be here. And similar to probably a lot of folks on the call, my construction company kind of started by accident. I wanted to get into real estate and development myself and then bought our first property and then needed to renovate it and 
you know, started to realize, wait a second, there's a, there's a lot of opportunity here. So I ended up creating a, I was a general contractor for, for many years and, you know, grew the business from re repairing tiles and then powder rooms and then kitchens and then additions and then new construction. So right now that company's um, only in Toronto and the greater Toronto area and a high end custom residential homes. And, but during that journey, I realized that a lot of homeowners don't really know what to do with their homes once it's built. Like you, you have a great relationship with the GC for a period of time, and then the GC goes away and you have, you might have this beautiful home, but you're not entirely prepared on how to take care of it. Your HVAC, not only do the filters need to be cha uh, changed, you got to maintain the thing. Why do you have to clean your gutters and so on? And I realized that there was an opportunity for um, a, kind of like a GC for the small stuff. So I started this company called Setter and it was technically a managed marketplace for home services, but we, we like to call it more of a concierge for homeowners. And the point of Setter was actually to be a retention tool for my construction company, to be able to speak to these users throughout the year we would, you know, re refinish their marble or their floors or remind them to clean their windows just to keep ourselves top of mind so that when their kids grew up or when their friend was doing a reno, they would refer me. And the demand for having someone to help out homeowners was, was so high that we decided to actually extricate that business from the construction company and, and go off on our own. And, and similar to Dan and Workies, we raised, we raised some venture capital and expanded to the US and we were acquired by Thumbtack at the end of 2020. And um, now at Thumbtack, I'm focusing on new ways to distribute our product, both to homeowners and to pros. Amazing, thanks David, really appreciate that, all those insights. Perfect, now, now running a business, there's currently a ton of different challenges and it can be definitely be very difficult. And with all these challenges and obstacles to overcome, you know, we want to, to learn more about Dan and David's expertise when it comes to managing and scaling any field, field service business. David, you, you're, you're first up. Can you share some of the challenges you faced when you were running your contractor business? So there are so many challenges that everyone here faces. And I'll start off by reiterating a lot of contractors end up going out on their own and they might not have been working for someone else before they see an opportunity and they go after it and they might develop some subject matter expertise, maybe on the installation side, maybe on the dispatch side, but nobody really has it all. And everyone's going to run into problems about like acquiring customers, then giving them a delightful experience. Even doing the job is a problem. So what I will say is you can't do it all at once. And every year, try to focus on optimizing one form of your business. And one of the beautiful parts about, you know, companies like Workies and Thumbtack is both of us take care of an entire slice of the pie. Workies is, is a software to run your entire business. Thumbtack, just make sure you have enough demand to fill your funnel. Like it's infinitely scalable. So it's, I would just lean heavily on the expertise in the space um, as you're starting your business. Wonderful. Thanks, David. Dan, do you have anything to, to add to that? Yeah, def definitely. So when you're first starting out, I mean, yes, you want to grow, you want to find more clients and, you know, 2022, there's literally a million ch channels to go about it. Uh, and everybody are knocking at your door. We offer advertising on Google. We'll do search engine optimization. We'll do this. We'll do that. Um, and more and more pros are going to uh, marketplaces like Fomtech, where you, you get the benefit of like really drilling down to the pain uh, and qualifying the customer. So that's important. You have to remember. So even if you're paying for this type of lead, it, it is qualified for you, which is basically equals, you know, time you would spend at the office qualifying and answering those phones yourself. Uh, one thing that was very important to me as we were growing is retaining customers. Now, you might ask yourself, retaining customers in Locksmith, I mean, how, how many times does a person get locked out? Uh, the answer is some people get locked out a lot, but, uh, more than that, you know, when you identify, uh, certain local 
uh, elements that you can work with. Like if you're doing work for a realtor or for a maintenance company, you know, uh, try to generate the next revenue of growth. You know, always look at your local market as a resource. I mean, obviously you want to advertise, you want to grow, but you want to make sure that there's something that fuels your business beyond that as you're, uh, you know, moving forward and growing the business. I'd actually like to add one more thing. And it's the easiest thing to be distracted by. And it's new revenue. So retaining customers is, is crucial. But if you don't deliver a great experience, it's going to be very difficult to retain them. Imagine if you go to a restaurant and it takes an hour for the waiter to bring the bill. Um, making sure that you handle that last 10% of the job, which unfortunately, a lot of us might not do the best at that last 10%. That's actually crucial to getting another job in the future and it's free marketing. So it's very easy to be distracted by the deposit for the next job and maybe not finish to 100% the previous job. But a lot of people forget that one, your profit margin is probably in that last 10%. And then two, the only thing that they're gonna remember is the last few days of the job or the last little bit about the job. So, um, to lead up to the retention that Idan is talking about, uh, make sure you finish the job well. Definitely, yes. Perfect, Thank, thanks for sharing some of the challenges that you faced. Well, now, now that we've discussed some of the challenges that Dan and David have you know, explained, we can start going into understanding some of the solutions that, that can help grow your business in the right way. Uh, now I'm going to turn it over to Wes, who's going to help guide the conversation with Dan and David to uncovering some of those solutions and, and how you can scale your business. Hey, guys. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm really excited to be here and help lead the next phase of the discussion. I've been trying to keep up with the chat a little bit, and so a lot of good discussion there. The first bullet point I would say uh, – that is especially true for growing your field service business is when it comes to using the right tools to prepare your business and staff for upsells and growth opportunity. So I'm going to pass this off to our panel to talk about this in depth because this is really important. If Dan, if you can start here and then David, feel free to chime in and I'll pass it to you after Dan is done. Definitely. So, um, this part is important. Um, I mean, it's too many times that uh, I saw service businesses uh, kind of uh, perceive themselves as a, as a repair service. Um, so that means they're there to solve uh, an immediate problem or repair. Uh, where, in fact, when you come into a home, you are considered an expert. And no matter what industry you're in, there's always premium services. There's always uh, premium services that that industry holds. And customers will not know about them unless you offer them. Okay, so if you're a locksmith, uh, you're the person to recommend high security locks. If you're an HVAC, uh, you need to be selling maintenance contracts. Um, you know, if you're a garage door repair, um, you don't have to install those white vinyl doors all the time. I mean, there's designs today that completely uh, reimagine the way houses look. You always have to pitch those services because you're the person that can offer them. I mean, people will not look at their house and say, well, you know, maybe it's time to replace the door. Uh, I mean, it, it will happen on occasion, but, you know, uh, most times are like when they need a repair. You have to prepare yourself for that. You have to, up, uh, to offer your premium services. Obviously, work is, you know, provides tools for that to give you kind of a good, better, best template. But you always have to focus on that. It's not just a repair organization. It's a sales organization. Awesome. Can I, can I yep. uh, yeah, go ahead, David. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, so, so similar to what Don was saying, you, you have to be an expert. And, you know, we, we all refer to that as subject matter expertise. And I would approach customers um, really from one of two different ways. I would either be going in there and the expression was, you know, how can I help them find their happiness? Or, you know, how can I help solve for pain? So first you have to discover it. So you, you can go for the happiness route or you can go for the pain route. Both are equally effective. But what you have to break it down to is, 
you have to be asking questions and actively listening to the responses. And people don't know what they don't know. And so like you done was saying, white vinyl garage door. But you know what? There is like a quarter cut sawn maple uh, options to put in there. If you know absolutely everything about your industry and you can get a little bit excited about it, you will help your customers get excited. And if you're asking them questions like, why do you want to do this? Uh, the responses are going to be amazing. It could be, you know, why are you thinking about uh, insulation? Well, one of you likes to go to bed early and one of you likes to host. Well, maybe insulation's not actually the right answer. Maybe we need to build an addition in the back so you can entirely get your entertaining in the backyard when someone goes to sleep. Um, that was obviously extreme, but with the garage door, for example, as you're talking and getting excited about it, a lot of garage doors now have Bluetooth options and wireless opening. And that's not a significant upgrade and most people are gonna take it. So you have to have subject matter expertise. You have to ask probing questions and actively listen to everything they're saying to find an opportunity to help them find their happiness or to solve some pain points that they're gonna give to you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, David, at, at what point did you, cause you said you started with like, you know, tile repairs and, you know, moved up. I mean, at what, at what point, like, did you see that? Okay. So the, the luxury home renovations are more of my forte. So the, the truth is, is we all are really good at something and we're not the best at everything. And I happen to be really, I, I excelled at, helping people find their happiness. And it was also something in luxury products and home building and construction was something I was always very interested in. So I found that I was gravitating towards the higher end finishes. And also I liked going to nicer restaurants and I liked nice things myself. So it was easier for me to get enthusiastic about these finer products. And then my enthusiasm would be able to transfer to the customer and then all of a sudden they were starting to go along the ride with me. And instead of putting in ceiling speakers, we were having the whole house with Sono and Sonos and a rack in the basement. But it was really understanding where I was excelling and what I liked and what I could be passionate about. And then using that passion to direct my customers into uh, you know, a place where they'd also be passionate and happy. I see. So if you're excited about the products, uh, the sales comes naturally. Nobody wants, you know, if you're getting like dishwashers, right? Like your dishwasher is not going to last past 10 years. If you're going to a replacement after seven years, sorry, if you're going to repair after seven years, you should be going with the option to give them a replacement and you should be giving them the, you should be prepared to give them that good, better, best option. But if someone's going to go and just like, oh, whatever, let's just fix it. You're never going to get that sale. Definitely. You're just going to have a repair and you know what? It's going to break a year later. And then they're going to have this negative feeling about you. And why didn't this person just tell me, or at least give me the option? People yeah. are spending money. Give them an experience, like make, help them enjoy it. Construction sucks sometimes. So <laughs> like try to make the experience as good as possible for them. Yeah, definitely. You gotta, you, you gotta look at the businesses again. You know, a lot of, I've seen a lot of pros do that. They really don't understand the power that they have. I mean, it's, it's, you're the person that advice actually counts. And, you know, for us, you know, we were working as an emergency locksmith organization, sending people, uh, you know, every day out and nights. And, you know, once we got into like high security locks and access control, uh, we just within two months, we just started closing the office at night. Like this was not worth it for us anymore. You know, it was just we we're in a different business. Yeah. And that that's what's exciting about, you know, everyone here is an entrepreneur, like everyone has their own has their own business and the gravity of that success is going to take you to where you want to be. So, you know, really understand your product, use your IQ, and then you're going to find that people want that and then focus on that niche. Definitely. All right. Great, great discussions on the first point, which I essentially would sum up as become a sales pro from what I'm hearing from you guys. Mm -hmm. But uh, I, I think let's, let's move on to the next bullet point, which is it, it's really important to be saving time with better processes. So, I, I mean, that can, 
also include how quickly you respond to leads, to customers, et cetera. But I'm going to pass this off to David to begin this conversation. And then Dan, obviously, feel free to jump in, just mm -hmm. similar to the last slide. So here it's how can you make your own life better? How can you help your future self from what you know is going to be a problem? So one example of this would be, you know, ordering windows, doors, flooring, certain materials take a really long time. And with the supply chain, what it is now, um, it's even worse. So I ended up putting these in my Gantt charts. When do I need to have the windows ordered by? When do I have to have X, Y, Z ordered by? And that would save, you know, six months down the road, David, a lot of frustration if we weren't on time. So I every once in a while in the beginning, I would look at my week. What did I do during the week? What was good? What was bad? And, you know, if there was a delayed window order, fine, I fixed that. Another one that I found was I was going to Home Depot and so was my business partner. We, we had no business going to Home Depot. And we did the math one week and each of us had gone to Home Depot something like five or 10 times each. And we did the math on that. And then we also looked at, well, how much would a courier cost? Or there's a ton of companies like Reno Run and Toolbox. And we did sort of the math on the ROI and we never went to Home Depot again. And then we started to say, you know what, to the employees, you're never going to Home Depot again. And we started doing every Friday, making sure everyone did a material list for the next week. And if anyone did have to go to get materials, we would share that to the group and then you can buy them sort of um, together. But the main takeaway here is you save time with better processes. You save money with better processes. Your, empl your employees will retain at a higher rate with better processes. Your customers will come back to you if you have better processes. So the easiest way to go about it for me in the way that I was doing it was every couple quarters, I would just, what did I do that week? And I would literally write down everything that I did. And it's like, what was I, what did I want to continue doing? What caused problems or where could I lean into further to make more money? Yeah, definitely. I mean, when you, when you make yourself more efficient, I mean, the money comes soon after and it does affect retention of employees. Definitely. People do not like to work in a messy environment. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm all for that with the tools that exist today. I mean, I'm always surprised to see what people actually come up with, with, uh, you know, with automations that we have now and Zapier and stuff like that. I mean, it's, it's all available for you. You can literally save money, time and focus. Most importantly, if you, uh, kind of look at your process and say, okay, how can I get it to do, you know, instead of five stops a day per tech, how can I get to a point that I'm doing eight stops per day? Or how can I increase the capacity of, you know, how many follow-ups do I do on estimates or leads? Um, this is something that we've seen actually a lot with the, with the farm tech leads. You know, if you create a process in which you automate and respond, respond quickly, you literally see the ROI coming up right away. Like if you have in work is you set up some sort of a template of lead follow-up and automate the processes after that. I mean, the data shows these are like, it increases conversions by 30%. And this relates to everything, basically, you know, anything that you can think of, you know, uh, we have a feature called call masking, you know, uh, we literally invented that for ourselves. And that's years before Uber had like masking for their drivers is because we didn't know uh, how fast does the locksmith call the client. I mean, we had an issue with job cancellations. And we found out after kind of looking back at the data that when somebody calls out a locksmith, they're not sure that he's coming. Unless they hear the person in the van with the tools jiggling in the back, they're not sure they're coming. They're actually going to keep calling other companies. So that initial call was always important to us. So we actually developed call masking and made sure that if you're assigned, you automatically get a follow-up text with this uh, relay phone number that is not the customer and we get an update directly on the dashboard that tells us, hey, you made the call. And that process always ensured that this is working, that the job is not being canceled, that everybody are doing their part uh, around that. And that's also around like tracking and, uh, you know, figuring out your ROI. Uh, I remember the first time that, uh, that the yellow pages, back at the time, if you guys remember, there were still yellow pages. 
so uh, SBC Yellow Pages, they used to come every, you know, uh, six months to extend the contract and they always asked for more because you know, people wanted to advertise back then. And they came one time and they asked for a higher number for the new renewal for our ads. And then they were surprised that this locksmith, uh, this uh, 25-year-old locksmith is giving them like a whole uh, pie chart with the ROI from each one of their numbers and their ads. Uh, they had to come down with the price. I mean, they could not argue with these hard numbers. Uh, that's how, you know, that process of making sure that every job, I literally know what side of the page it came from, what phone, what advertising, that saved me so much money. And, you know, nobody can argue with data. So these points of efficiency, they just make the difference in your business. And that's actually also why we integrated with Workies. It's, you know, we were just literally, it was coming down to how much time are people spending dealing with the leads for Thumbtack and then bringing them over to the Workies platform. And we realized it's, it's quite a bit of time. So we just developed an integration where it automatically goes into Workies. You guys have your responder. Response times have gone down something like 90% to our leads and we're seeing a massive uptick in conversion just from spending time looking <laughs> at the, you know, the pain in your life too, like what's causing you grief in, in work and you can solve it. And the opportunity is, is really endless. This is a great, great discussion on this. Um, I, I think people really do need to automate things that can be automated and like again, tracking your leads, tracking your conversions, uh, where the money is coming from, that is equally as important. Uh, the next step to making sure you can grow your revenue through uh, great processes, great stuff, is to make your clients feel like they have a special experience. Make each customer feel special. Um, I, I'm very curious Dan, uh, what you did back in your days as a locksmith, and obviously David as well, to make customers feel like they had a great experience. So if you can kind of talk about that a little bit, that would be great. Yeah, definitely. And uh, this relates to what David said before. Um, it is an experience. I mean, a lot of us would prefer to look at, you know, a service call or something that somebody needs an emergency or a repair as, you know, something of a hassle. But it is an experience. People can have a bad experience like, oh, my dishwasher broke or my door is, you know, my door lock is not working and I have to call this repairman. But the person who comes over can really make it into an experience. So for me, it was, I mean, we facilitated back then in uh, 2005 um, when it wasn't that common, a whole caller ID and call tracking system. So that means uh, when a person calls in, we initially, you know, we immediately knew who they were. Okay. So like uh, if a realtor or a property manager, uh, you know, they get that, you know, you know, they, they give you that call and like, hey, Janet, I mean, yeah, how can I help you? It changes their entire thing for them, you know, and then you know what store they're talking about or what property they're talking about. Uh, the whole communication, as I mentioned before, that was super important for us. Like we literally made sure that our techs are calling and texting all the time. Hey, I'm about to be late. Something came up, you know, I can be there closer to that hour. Um, asking for direction, just anything to get you to talk to the customer. Uh, follow-ups, were you happy with the job? Uh, you know, moving more towards 2010, towards, you know, when we sold the business, reviews became a big thing, okay? These uh, reviews can actually make or break you. Uh, so we started, we didn't have automation tools around, around then, but, you know, really kind of making sure that the customer is happy. Um, and again, this goes into remarketing. How do you offer your next premium services to these clients? And, you know, just a postcard for the holidays or something like that. You got to nurture those local relationships. You know, not everything is new revenue or acquiring new clients. And there's always that part that something didn't go right. You know, a customer is not happy. Uh, something is not 100%. Don't argue. Don't, don't try to be right. You know, it's, it, it's not worth it. I mean, it, always make sure that the customer is happy. Uh, even at the cost of taking some loss, this reflects on your future projects. Yeah, I, I really couldn't agree more there. 
you know, if I break it down, there's there's sort of two ways that you can approach it. You can approach it down like the EQ route, like the the emotional quotient, or the IQ. And you know, Idan was talking a lot about really making sure that even though it sounded quite tactical, like the calling and the following up, you have to understand that if if somebody doesn't have hot water or they're locked out of their house, they're in an, a very bad place. They're quite anxious. So every time you communicate to them makes them feel a little bit better. Um, and so that that's really quite important. And then of course, we talked about your subject matter expertise and you know explaining things to people. Why are you doing this? Is, is they really appreciate that. But one thing that we did that I think was, was potential, I mean, I think it's, it was unique to us at the time. We would, every time we were on our way to a sales call, and then eventually it got any time we were on our way to sort of a repair, we would notify the customer when we were out and we would say, what kind of coffee do you want? And we would bring them a coffee because we we're going to walk around or we would just bring them something. And, you know, there, something happens when a human gives a gift to someone else. It's actually called the ben, Benjamin Franklin effect. And he would famously give away books to people because that like sort of transaction creates a ton of trust. And then all of a sudden, even if you're going over for a terrible deficiency call, you know, you're employing this tactic that is going to help remind them that you're both human and this could be a good, this is going to be a great experience. We're going to get through it together. And, you know, we're sort of breaking bread at the same time. So the bringing the coffee every time, or at least offering was just always something that I found, you know, encouraged the goodwill and sort of increased the trust that we had together. Definitely. I have, I have actually a friend who uh, deals in construction. That's the first thing he does every morning, no matter what project he's going to visit. Uh, you know, he always comes with bagels and coffee. He says, um, um, it, it, cause it's such a situation, you know, your house is all taken apart renovation. I mean, everybody can agree is not a pleasant uh, uh, situation. And he, he just, you know, he makes you smile first thing in the morning. It's five bucks for a smile. Who doesn't yeah. want to do that? <laughs> I'll buy smiles for five bucks, definitely. Awesome. Let's uh, move on to the next point, which we had a great question actually in the chat, which I, I feel like kind of relates here. So the next, the next topic of the discussion is to make it easier for everyone to do their job more efficiently. We're talking about technicians. We're talking about business owners, dispatchers, everyone. And so Julian Richards in the chat asked, how can I encourage employees to make upsells, which I feel like goes really well into this discussion, as well as what we talked about in the first slide. So um, to, to begin this discussion, Dan, can I pass this off to you to start? Yeah, sure. So, uh, I mean, there's the obvious uh, commission structure. Uh, which, you know, I've used myself and built it into Workies uh, as one of the original features that we had. Uh, but that's, you know, on one side. Um, you have to ramp up uh, just the way you, David mentioned, like you have to believe in the product, you have to show that to your employees as well. Okay, so that means uh, get your employees in a room, you know, once a week, once in two weeks, you know, get some, again, coffee, cake, uh, I don't know, order in. Uh, some pizzas um, and, you know, talk to them about sales, talk to them about, you know, the kind of pushbacks they get from, uh, from clients. Okay. What are the opportunities? Uh, what do you see most commonly in homes that warrant you bringing up an upsell? So if you have an honest discussion with them about it and, you know, maybe some role playing and a role playing always helps like, okay, what if the customer tells me that, well, you should offer that. Or you should tell them, yeah, but, you know, this neighborhood, uh, you know, all the houses are, you know, have this type of color and you're the only one that has this. Um, or if you're selling a, an HVAC agreement, you know, it's very easy to kind of show the financial instinct uh, in, you know, making your system last for 15 years instead of, of eight years. Uh, so number one, commissions, very easy. People work for money. They make more money. It's an obvious incentive. But the other one is, you know, do some sort of a process internally, kind of, uh, you know, group gatherings when you kind of ramp them up and, you know, share your experience with them on what you see the value of uh, that product for the customer. Yeah, I, I mean, just piling on, 
product knowledge sessions, crucial. You need to be subject matter experts and so do your, so does your team so that they're prepared and they know how to look out for it. You know, the, the role playing. So a lot of if then logic, like if you get to a house and you know, it's, it, it's a younger family and they seem like they're tax savvy, then now's a good time to suggest an August Bluetooth lock as well. Mm -hmm. um, so commission, obviously people should be rewarded if they're being accretive to your business. Um, but I guess the only other thing I would add there is no one wants to feel like, you know, when you get your oil changed and it's like the advertise is $29.99 and you go to get your oil change and you walk out, it's 150 bucks. No one has a good experience doing that. So I would be wary about, you know, talking about upselling. And that's kind of why I developed the term helping people find their happiness. It's like, you, you don't want a customer to ever feel that they've been taken advantage of. So you want to co coach your employees on, you know, how can you sort of actively sell, but seem as though you're passively doing it through recommendations and just trying to find the best solution for them. But yeah, I, you wouldn't want those bad reviews to come in and say, oh, they recommended I replace my dishwasher when I don't need to. So it is a bit of a fine balance. Yeah, it is. I mean, you don't want to, yeah, there is a fine balance between you recommending something and, you know, a customer. Uh, it, it has to come from a professional place. Okay. So that means if you give your honest, like, you know, reasoning behind, behind why you think this is better, usually customers respond to it. I mean, versus just saying, you know, uh, this would look better, uh, you know, instead of just saying, yeah, this lasts more and, I, I'm a big believer in data, and I think it applies here too. So again, if you're installing something that has an expected uh, lifespan and that person is uh, probably going to end up paying again, you have to kind of bring that into the light because a lot of the times upgrades or you know uh, upsells do usually save money and time over the long period. So you have to kind of focus on the facts. People cannot argue with facts. Awesome. Uh, so the the last basically way that we're recommending to help grow your business is essentially marketing. So you got to plan your business presence according to your size, industry, and clientele. Um, I, I'm going to let David kind of begin the discussion on this. Can you talk a little bit about how to market yourself correctly according to these aspects, size, industry, and clientele? So it, it, it's, it's a fine balance. You know, one time I went to go quote a job and it was early in, in my career and, and we had actually bought a dump trailer because we found that we were spending too much money on, on a junk removal. So my business partner and I, we just did a dump run and then we went to go look at, um, to go quote a job. And we got there and it was, it was like a 3000 square foot condo. It was, it was magnificent. And the, the two homeowners uh, were, were, were quite professional and they were looking for a very high end job. And I showed up in my kind of my, my really dirty car hearts and, you know, I was literally covered in dust and I followed up later and no response. And then I followed up to the referral and they gave me a piece of advice that I took home with me. And it was, they, they were expecting to hire a construction manager or someone who was running a business, not somebody who is sort of stuck in the weeds. And that change, I never showed up to a, a quoting visit because they are interviews without the appropriate attire again. And I moved my portfolios, like I got a nice, everything changed from that moment. So you, you really do have to look the part and it is quite important, you know, make sure your truck's clean, make sure when you open up the back that it's well organized. You don't want to be one of the people that has all the tools and milk crates because that person's not organized. And that means they're going to drop the ball somewhere. So I, I do think marketing yourself, um, there, there's a lot of, there's a few visual components to it. When it comes to marketing your business, a channel mix is important. You're always going to, you're going to do a great job with your customers. So you're going to get some referrals. You're going to, they're going to come back to you. You, I, everyone goes to online first. So if you don't have an online presence, 
unless you really don't want new customers, there's not going to happen. So obviously Thumbtack is the best place to go for a, a really targeted approach to get leads. But then I would also say invest in building relationships with other experts in your space. They might have, um, there might come a time where there's a job too big for them or the manufacturers of your products. For instance, I often call the manufacturer if I'm in a new state and ask who's the person buying the most X, Y, Z. So a channel mix, understanding that you kind of need to look the part. And when it comes to your size, that does change. When you're an owner operator, you kind of have to be in the work clothes. But by the time you're hiring your third employee or you're rolling your third truck, you got to have someone else. You got to have other people on the we in the weeds while you're running the business. So that scales as you scale. Awesome. Uh, Dan, is there anything to add there? Um, yes. I mean, uh, a good advice I got once from uh, there was uh, an older uh, locksmith here in San Diego that was always going and harassing when I was starting out. And uh, he told me that's the that's the most important thing that you have to do at least uh, once in six months. Go and repaint your truck. Um, you know, uh, I, I I didn't understand you know how that relates to a locksmith, but later on you do understand. People perceive you the way uh, the way you appear. Uh, so that means if you want to offer better services, if you want to get better clientele, yes, you have to uh, you have to act the part. Also, online presence. Um, I mean, people today just judge you on your online presence. So that means if your website looks like it's from 1999, uh, that's how people will perceive you. Uh, reviews obviously are very important. And yes, there needs to be a way to contact you without giving you a call. I mean, uh, I know it's a bit counterintuitive from an app that sells phone service, but uh, people today will do anything, especially millennials, uh, in order to not give you a call. I mean, they'll text you, they'll use some sort of an online widget that you have. Um, so you need those. And, you know, luckily, yes, there is Fomtech, there is Workies, there is a lot of solutions out there that don't require you to go to a developer and build your own. Uh, but you, you do need to give this option. And I think the last two years, unfortunately, brought that more to light. You know, uh, people are more reliant on online tools. Uh, so that's definitely important, digital presence. And above everything is, yes, you got to, you have to maintain that, you know, local presence all the time. Uh, you have to make do with anybody in your area. If it's, a, if it's a dealership that needs car keys, if it's a property manager, if it's realtors, if it's, a, a, you know, a chain of stores, you have to maintain those relationships and you have to let, you have to kind of be proud of that, that you're providing services for Banana Republic or you're providing services for, you know, AT&T stores. This, you have to let people show that you are trusted and you are a brand. And that really exists also for service businesses. Awesome. Um, great discussion on the five tips to grow your business. Real quickly, before we jump into the q and I know we're about one minute before we were scheduled to end. So if we want to stick around for like five minutes or so and ask some questions, we can do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but quickly, I, I think most of you guys know about either Workies or Thumbtack or both of us. But together, we, we work on how to respond quicker to leads. So Thumbtack provides great high quality leads that will feed directly into Workies. So as long as these accounts are integrated and working correctly, um, you can respond quicker than your competition to these leads and book more jobs. And because you're responding quicker than your competitors. So because you're all attendees today, you get, and we'll, we'll summarize this stuff in a follow-up email and provide you links of stuff on how to sign up. I know there's a few questions on that in the chat, but because you're attendees today with Workies, you'll get two months free uh, on our, on our software. And then with Thumbtack, you get a hundred dollars of free leads. So you can kind of test both services out and see how the integration works and how you can book these jobs quicker. And we'll put the links in the chat real quickly, just in, so you have it. In terms of questions, I, I know we got a few questions before the event, 
he came in and there's been a few sporadically, but I, I'm going to start here. And right now is the time to ask your questions because we'll keep this open for like five more minutes, depending on how many questions we have. So the first question that I pulled from the registration was, when is the right time to hire an office manager? Um, I, I don't know if Dan or David, you want to take that, but uh, that was a question we received on the chat or on the registration before. You want to take that, David? Sure. I mean, I'll actually, the, the right time, you want to hire a bookkeeper as soon as you possibly can. And then you want to go from a, book tr a bookkeeper to an actual financial controller as soon as you possibly can. Because I hate to say it, but almost everybody in the chat is losing money. And most nine out of 10 contractors that do go bankrupt, it's because of cash flow. So the first thing to do is take control over your cash flow. And then when it comes to hiring an office manager, I mean, I was a general, so it, it took us, we probably had like five crews going before we actually had someone managing the production um, outside of one of the owners. Well, for me, it was the point that uh, I couldn't go out and see jobs for myself. Okay, and when it got to the point that I'm, I, I cannot get out of the office, because uh, it was very important to me to audit jobs that are ongoing, to come out and see that this person is doing a good job. If there's a big installation on a building, I want to come out there. I want to shake, shake the hands of the managers there. Uh, once I got to a point that I, I cannot leave the office, there's just too much to do. That's that's the point that I said I, I need help. You know, that's that's where I said, okay, it's worth the cost. Great. Um... Next question was directed at David from Janet in the chat. Where did you say you buy supplies if it was not Home Depot? Got it. So Home Depot, for a builder, for like a contractor, you're going to Home Depot if you've sort of forgotten <laughs> something. You should be ordering your materials like a week in advance, you know, from a fastenal, if, you're, if it's drywall, from like a, a drywall wholesaler. Um, you'll get better pricing from most places and then they do delivery and then the delivery, they don't just dump it on the street. They walk it in. So I would try to coach my team to only go to Home Depot if you needed to, because you were like, you needed a tube of PL or something like that. And yeah, so try to look for the wholesalers, try to look for, you know, the actual trim manufacturers rather than, than going there because that's where the consumer is shopping. You, you know, you need to have like one deeper level of expertise and access than the consumer. Definitely. There's always, there's always something specific in your industry. I mean, Home Depot is fine when you're stuck and you need to get something right now. But whatever you're buying, there's usually a manufacturer or direct dealer that will give you better products and probably a better uh, pricing. Okay, so Gil says that they're in the installation business. Their goal is to not leave the cheap. Yeah, <laughs> installation business, sorry. Their, their goal is to not be the cheapest in town. Um, what is, besides quick response time, David or Dan, whoever wants to take this, what is the best way to make most of your leads that you're getting? You're just honest and upfront. Like if you're competing on cost, it's a race to the bottom. And, you know, there's, there's this sort of rule of three that I kind of think about. And a customer can only choose two out of three. They want the most cost effective. I also don't use the word cheap. I say cost effective. So there's the most cost effective option. There's the fastest option or the, the highest quality option. And you can really only choose two of three. And if someone's looking for, you know, a fast and dirty, which is, you know, typically you would sort of see those as like landlords might be looking for that. It's just not for me. I don't want the lead. I'm not going to win. It's not going to be a good experience. So in that case, um, I win with no. And I say, you know what? Thank you so much for reaching out. I'm not the best person for you on this, but, you know, Wes or X company would be good. I don't waste my time quoting because you can go broke quoting. So I'm very particular about the jobs that I want. I let the customer know that the, the cost of goods sold is the cost of goods sold. Like a two by four is a two by four. The price isn't that much different. It's the experience that they're going to have. And your job is to provide them a better experience for which out of those two out of three of uh, things they're looking for. 
So you get your pitch down. Um, yeah, I, I would never compete on cost. Yeah, definitely. I have, I have a friend that uh, every time he goes out and quotes a customer, he always makes sure to mention them. Uh, you know, I'm not the cheapest, you know, but I am the best. So, you know, it, and that line always makes the customer laugh. Uh, but it's very important that you be upfront with that. You know, I'm, I'm not here to compete for cost. If you're looking to get away cheap and, you know, get that, you know, be upfront. Like, I'm not the person for you. Yeah. I wouldn't even say that I'm the best because I don't think I'm the best, but it's, I'm confident that to me, the most cost effective is it's got to be a different, it's got to be either different materials, different labor, or like no tools. So it's a worse experience. And that's just not the game I want to play because six months down the road, all of that's going to haunt you when something goes wrong or the sub trade doesn't warranty their item. It's just not worth it to to be the cheapest in the room to use the word definitely and 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 trust is a big factor i mean trust is a big factor when you're letting somebody do something in your home um you know especially in bigger projects i feel the more trust that you kind of send out uh i know uh, i know contractors that actually collect video reviews you know, of, uh, of their customers and they, they carry that around with them on their iPads yeah, just to kind of, you know, because trust is a big thing. People will pay a higher price uh, if they feel that they can trust you and that the work is guaranteed and you're not going to sleep well until you know that they got the best they can. And that's a big factor with a lot of customers. Awesome. I don't know if there are any more questions um, that are coming up in the chat, but I, we, from all of us up here, we really thank everyone for your time and joining us today. Again, the recording will be available um, afterwards. I, I believe it's just on this link. We're also going to email it out tomorrow for everyone, as well as those links we shared. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to respond to the email. Uh, but yeah, thank you all for your time, Dan, David, John, uh, and thanks for attending, everyone. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks, all.